SJC 12295, Care and Protection of Joseph C. Ms. O'Connor, good morning. Good morning, and may it please the court, <coughs> Anne O'Connor, on behalf of Mr. C. Uh, my brother for the child will be taking three minutes of argument time this morning, and I will take uh, 12 on behalf of Mr. C. The appeals court single justice determined that General Laws Chapter 119, Section 29C, means what it says, that the Department of Children and Families and the trial courts must adhere to their respective obligations under that statute, and that where DCF fails to follow the law and causes harm to a child and his family, a court can and should enter orders designed to remediate that harm in the best interests of the child. By affirming those principles, this court will advance the intent of the United States Congress and our own state legislature, promote the cause of justice, and do much to protect the most vulnerable citizens of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. The first issue that was raised um, in the report by the single justice is whether the uh, determination requirements of section 29 uh, C, that is uh, whether the court must determine whether the department made reasonable efforts to avoid, uh, prevent or eliminate the need to remove a child, whether that determination must be made at a 72 hour hearing or only at the initial custody proceeding. The answer is, there is there any reason to do it at the initial custody proceeding at all? The 29C, Your Honor, says that if a court transfers custody to the department, the court shall make those determinations. Was that considered a transfer of custody at the initial ex parte hearing? The ex parte hearing results in an order of custody for 72 hours, Your Honor. That satisfies that portion of the statute, in other words. That's my understanding, Your Honor. Okay. Could you help me with the, some background? I'm trying to figure out what does this mean if the department doesn't make this determination? What's the practical effect for the parent and the child? I, I don't understand. Is there an, an affirmative obligation anywhere in state law to do this reasonable effort uh, process before removing a child. I understand it's federal policy, but where does it say that they have to do that? Um, in the department's enabling statute, Your Honor, Chapter 18B, Section 3, the department is mandated first to provide services to a family and to remove a child only if the provision of services um, to the family have been unable to ameliorate the situation such that the child remains at risk. So it's in the department's enabling statute. It was essentially the reason the department was created, was to um, help families and children in need um, and, and help parents to be able to parent their children safely. So it, at, at the risk of stating the obvious, under your interpretation of 29C, the, the judge has to make that uh, determination both at initial yeah. and at 72. Yes, Your Honor. In Section 24, um, the last, I think the fourth paragraph of Section 24 sets out that um, after the ex parte or initial custody award is, is made, notice must be given to the parents, and then it provides at the 72-hour hearing, the judge must determine whether sh custody shall continue. The judge also shall make the determinations required under 29C. Which, which contemplates that the judge gets, has more information at 72 hours than at initial. Absolutely, Your Honor, and this court talked about that in, in care and protection of Robert um, as well, and in this court. Of course, that's when the parents are present, presumably. Correct, Your Honor. And can uh, contest anything. And was there something in here that suggested that there was something wrong in the um, uh, affidavit of the uh, social worker at the ex parte hearing? The social worker in the ex parte hearing submitted an affidavit in which she stated that she did make reasonable efforts and that the parents failed to comply. At the hearing, she was very clear that she made no efforts whatsoever, and she was not required, in her view, to have made any efforts whatsoever. And the judge so. then didn't make a subsequent uh, finding as to whether or not uh, reasonable efforts had made, had been made. That's correct. Because Your if Honor. that had happened, would the result have been inevitably been that result that reasonable efforts were not made, or um, could there, is there an alternative? There's not an alternative in this situation. The judge did say orally during the 72-hour hearing, so that there was a different judge at the ex-party yeah. hearing. 
Um, the judge did say um, at the end of the 72-hour hearing that the department was not required to have made reasonable efforts um, because the child was at immediate risk, but the judge did not make any written determination, which is what the statute requires, a written determination and findings. The single justice said that um, the, even the oral determination was wrong as a matter of law because there are only four exceptions in 29C to the department's obligation to make reasonable efforts, and the one that um, the department proffered and the judge found is not included in that. Um, There's something odd, though, about if the child is at immediate risk that <laughs> there has to be somehow before custody can be transferred after a uh, hearing at which parties have notice and can appear, um, assume that they're, you know, assume that they're at the 72-hour hearing and that there's still this ongoing emergency. Are you saying that the judge cannot at that point say no more reasonable efforts need to be made before I'm um, going to continue the situation of having DCF custody? So the um, reasonable efforts determination would have been made at, at the ex party yes, stage. Right. And, and we're not saying, no one's ever said that a, anyone, uh, the department needs to leave a child in an unsafe situation. Clearly, they, if there's an emergency, eventually, if there's an emergency, the law requires them, and it's an emergency that's not one of the four that are uh, provided for in the statute. The law requires them to make some reasonable effort to remove the emergency. So in this case, the social worker, when it really came down to it, said, you know, what I was really concerned about was if there was a fire, they wouldn't be able to get out because there was so much clutter in the way of, you know, from the child's bed to his doorway and in the hallway. The, the big concern was they wouldn't be able to get out in the event of a fire. So the, the simple answer there would be to ask the parents, is there somewhere you can go with your child for a couple days until we get this situation sorted out? Or as it happened, the aunt came to um, the house that night, and another simple effort would have been to allow the, the child to go stay at the aunt's house for a couple of days. There was no reason for the agency to take custody from the parents as a first resort. If she had made those offers and the parents said, no, never mind, we, you know, we insist on staying here with our child, we don't agree, it's an emergency, then, then she would have made the reasonable effort. It just would have been unavailing, and she could have removed the child. Is there any, any uh, situation where, other than the four that are enumerated in the statute, where the social worker can just say, this is so bad, this problem is so unsolvable that there's no reasonable effort that can be made in this case, and that's OK? The legislature apparently is of, of the um, opinion that those circumstances, any such circumstance, is covered in the four exceptions. Um, they intentionally, they did not include um, this you know, um, immediate harm, risk of harm exception in 29C. They did, however, include it in 11939H. And that's um, a section of the law that deals with children requiring assistance. And that section of the law provides that if a child is alleged to require assistance because he won't fulfill the reasonable commands of his parent, and there's a concern he won't show up for his hearing on the merits, he can be, um, the department can take custody of him for 15 days if the department made reasonable efforts or because of the emergency circumstance, uh, there were no reason the department didn't need to make reasonable efforts, or there were no efforts that could be made. So the exact language that appears in checkbox two of the trial court form, um, which again is not recognized in 29C, is actually recognized in 39H. 29C also is a very closed, um, it's a closed list of exceptions. There's no language saying including but limited to or something of that nature. Clearly the legislative intent was to keep that, that list of exceptions closed. Okay, let, let, me, let me make sure I understand. Uh, your view is that the determination in 29, the determination with respect to reasonable efforts must be made unless one of the four exceptions apply. Correct. Correct. Uh, do you also agree that if none of those four exceptions apply, that a judge may make a finding that says the department has not made reasonable efforts, but focusing on the last sentence of section 29C, 
I still determine and I still certify that continuation of the child in the home is contrary to the child's best interests, and I still direct that she be removed or he or she be removed from the home. The judge absolutely can find that the department failed to make reasonable efforts, but nonetheless that the child um, should be remanded to the agency's custody, absolutely. The consequence of making a finding that they've not perform reasonable efforts is not inevitably to say the child remains with the parents. Oh, no, absolutely not. The, um, the, the hope is, the intent of Congress when they passed the legislation um, was that the department would make reasonable efforts to remove taking children into foster care and therefore take fewer children into foster care, which would alleviate a lot of the harms that yeah. happen to children in foster care because the system is overburdened. Right. Um, this relates, though, to a question that I have uh, in terms of the form. Uh, in, what do you, uh, what is the response to the uh, uh, notion that by checking box two, the judge is determining that the removal of the child is the reasonable effort made by the department under the circumstances? I, I think that's untenable, Your Honor. Removing the child was the reasonable effort to avoid removing the child. I mean, I, I understand that's what was in the letter, but I, I can't think of any circumstance in which that's a tenable argument. Okay. What about, what, what's the department supposed to do? So you have uh, an immediate harm, you have none of the four exceptions, and uh, I, I think one of the exceptions is not somebody's wit witnessing serious, the kids witnessing serious violence in the home or domestic violence that can have a huge impact. Um, and, and, and uh, DCF is moving with alacrity. Um, what reasonable efforts are they supposed to make? I appreciate uh, uh, Chief Justice Keen's point that they can still remove even if there's no reasonable efforts, but if there's a dictate that you have to uh, apply reasonable efforts, what are they supposed to do? In this situation, it's obvious what they, what they can do. Right, and if, um, if you had a situation, so you're positing a domestic violence situation, um, if the department comes al across a family where there's um, domestic violence and um, the partners are living together with the children, a reasonable effort would be required to require one partner to leave the house and require the other partner to make sure he didn't come back, he or she didn't come back. Um, so there are, reasonable efforts aren't heroic efforts, this court has said that, or the appeals court said it in um, adoption of Lenore. It's just efforts that are reasonable in the circumstance. That could, Your Honor, be a situation if that were an ongoing domestic violence case that the children were subjected to, that would fall within the exception of repeatedly subjecting the children to conduct of an emotionally abusive nature. So that, that may, depending on the circumstances, a, a domestic violence case could fit within one of the four exceptions. Okay, thank okay, you. Thank you. <coughs> Lawson, good morning. May it please the court, Brian Clausen for the child. Your Honors, I, I would like to follow up with that question. There are other, uh, the Commonwealth has actually come up with domestic violence shelters, which the department often refers people to. And so that's a very reasonable effort. If the parent refuses to go, now you got a different situation, you know, and that's, in this case, we don't, there was an aunt there at the home, and by all, you know, we don't know whether that would have been a reasonable effort by the department to allow the child to go with the aunt, because they never, the judges never asked the question, and the department said it had no effort to do, no, no reason to do that. And but didn't the, the child go with the aunt the next day anyway? Absolutely. And is, is with the, with the yes. aunt now? Yes, for at least four, past four or five months. Right. And whatever, now, whatever efforts the department would come to the judge and say, well, why didn't you place the child there last, yesterday? Well, we had to run a quarry and we didn't have the quarry. Well, the judge could say, well, you know what? <laughs> you should have run a quarry. You don't put a child in foster care because you didn't run a quarry. We don't know what the answer to that question or is. Or the judge could presumably have said, okay, well, it's reasonable. You don't want to just know who this person is who walks through the door, but uh, you run the quarry as soon as you can. And I mean, isn't that? Well, that could have been There are two done. ways that could have gone, right? Right. In terms of reasonable efforts. 
Well, it, it was for a judge to decide, the right. trial judges to decide what it, are the, the department would explain what their reasonable efforts were, <coughs> and the judge would decide were those reasonable. Now, if they said, well, we would have placed her there last night, but we didn't have, we didn't have a quarry. Well, the state can come up with a quarry, a system, I think, pretty easily, where a judge might say, well, that's not a good enough reason. You, well, you can't does, keep Does kidding. DCF not have the capacity to get quarries at 3 o'clock in the morning? We don't know the answer to that, like especially in this case, because no one tried. They didn't explain why they didn't place with the aunt. And the judge, there weren't written determinations by either the ex parte judge or the 72 hour hearing judge to explain. Judge checked the box at the, seven, at the uh, ex parte hearing, right? Right, which doesn't tell us too much about why. And, and my hope it's it to some affidavit, um, right? She says, she checks the box and says, uh, after hearing the court determines after consideration of the health and safety of the child, and checks the box that says, the existing circumstances indicate that there's an immediate risk of harm or neglect, which precludes the provision of preventive services as an alternative to removal. Is this box two? This Correct. is box two. And then it says the basis for such certification and determination is as follows, which is C affidavit, and I presume that's the social worker's affidavit. It's, Correct. Uh, and that social worker's affidavit then had information that turned out not to be correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. And and we don't really know what the nature of that hearing was because we don't have a transcript or anything or a recording of the hearing that took place before Judge Fury. The ex parte hearing, typically, yes, there is no. It takes about two minutes, and it's there's really no hearing. It's a they stand up, swear to tell the truth, and it takes a minute, and you, swear what's in there is true, yes, and that's it. You, okay. You're not discounting the um, the Corey check. I mean, it, it, and I know this isn't the case because the aunt has custody. But if the aunt had a serious criminal history, it would be. It, it, it would be negligent in the least to, to put the child with the, with, the, with the aunt. Absolutely, Your Honor, but those are the efforts the judge, if the social, I mean, those are pretty reasonable efforts. We ran a quarry, we called to see if family were available, none were, That's, we made reasonable efforts. But when an aunt, when a family member standing right there in front of you and uh, lived minutes away, the mother called her, she came right over, if you went to her house, you would know right away the child was there, she testified. The child was with her three days a week, four to five hours a day. She was a considerable you know, person in this child's life. You would go in that house and go, I know this kid's gonna be okay here. You just that, would. That, that's these facts. Pardon? I, I guess those are, that's in this situation. Yes. I, I guess I'm, I'm concerned about um, the, the many pressures, to say the least, that are sometimes on victims of domestic violence where you know, they're not providing information in a way that would allow for a restraining order. And, and, and the child's still in the home, and it's really um, uh, uh, volatile. Uh, what, what is the DCF worker really supposed to do so that he or she can go to the judge and say, I made reasonable effort? Your Honor, I believe the, all of these situations would be limited by what the parents are willing to cooperate. In this case, the parents said, sure, the ch I, we agree the child could go. I give you that. Please. In a domestic violence yeah. case, if the social worker g gives a couple options, or maybe they'll decide, look, this is too serious. My efforts here are, it could be that the efforts are to inquire of the parents. Look, do you have any other family members that can take this child? And if there aren't, there aren't. Maybe the social worker says, that was my reasonable efforts. I was not going to allow this child with either parent, but my efforts were to try to find family. If a family member walked through the door right then and said, I'll take the child, then we could avoid a lot of placements in foster care. And that's what really concerns me with this case is the whole purpose of the statute says to avoid putting children in foster care and use all family resources when they're available. But I don't believe the department says, apparently we didn't get an answer to this. Is placing a child with a family member before you take custody and put them in foster homes, and this child went through a whole series of foster homes after this. He went through, a, he went into hotline homes, he went, so reasonable efforts can be a mere, try to call family. If they won't provide the names of family, well then they're doing their best. They're trying to do reasonable efforts. So. I see my lights on, and thank you, Your Honors. Thank I, you. I, I, would at, I would, if I could, just ask the court, the written findings and determinations at the 72-hour hearing, at the ex parte hearing, are critical, and hopefully would have answered the question in this case. Was placing the child with an aunt a reasonable efforts rather than DCF taking custody and putting the child in foster home going down that road? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Salcedo. 
May it please the court. <clears throat> Richard Salcedo for the Department of Children and Families. The reasonable efforts requirement was established in 1980 by Congress and um, was meant to um, ensure that these efforts were made prior to uh, removing a child and um, it occurred at a time when uh, Congress was concerned about children uh, being removed inappropriately or unnecessarily and um, at that time the whole issue of foster care drift was, an, was a major one. 17 years later Congress uh, adopted or enacted the Adoption and Safe da Families Act and although uh, the reasonable efforts requirement was maintained, it, uh, the emphasis at that time was on safety and health and well-being of children, that that was a particular focus. And the reason for that uh, was there was some misinterpretation of the reasonable efforts requirement uh, to require, for the sake of family preservation, uh, to allow children to remain in potentially unsafe uh, and hazardous Those things homes. are not at war with each other necessarily, right? That the safety of the child and the well-being of the family can be, in fact, coordinate parts of the issue? Yes, I mean, certainly the department has that uh, dual ob obligation. We recognize that um, we have the primary uh, goal to preserve the family uh, wherever possible, uh, to provide services where we can, um, but there are certain situations, certain circumstances where um, providing those services is not possible. And well. in this particular um, case, we had an investigating social worker who found uh, a child who she believed w was living in, or he, uh, she believed he was living in uh, deplorable uh, conditions and that um, particular hazards, uh, safety concerns were present at that time. There's, there's no dispute that the child needed to be removed from those conditions, right? The, the question is where is the child removed to? Right. And, uh, at, at that particular time, due to the expediency, the removal occurred. It was later in the day. Um, there was the possibility of placement with the aunt, and as was uh, mentioned by uh, your honors, placement did pl take place the next day with the aunt, um, and the child is currently uh, with that aunt. What 29C requires is that upon the initial removal of the child and the issuing of uh, the order of custody of the child to the department, the, the uh, judge um, must make a, a, cert a written certification, a determination of reasonable efforts and a written certification that reasonable efforts have been made. And that typically takes place at the initial hearing. Well, you custody say that typically hearing. takes place. That's not clear under the statute that that's when it's only supposed to take place. It says here, upon entry of the order, notice to appear before the court, this is after the ex parte order, Notice to appear before the court shall be given to either parents, both parents, the guardian with care and custody or another custodian. At that time, the court shall determine whether temporary custody shall continue between, before beyond 72 hours. And then the next sentence is the court shall also consider the provisions of section 29C and shall make a written certification and determination. So it's not clear that the only time this is required is at the ex parte hearing. It looks to me like there's a very good um, reason for thinking the statute contemplates it's going to be made at the 72 hour hearing as well. Well, I think your honor, you're reading, your honor is reading from section 24 um, and what uh, our interpretation or reading of that language is what the responsibilities are of the judge uh, following the initial transfer of custody of the children, of the or child to the department. And I think what that statute sets out um, is that there are certain things a judge must do, including uh, no